The first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Oh, the humanity! The fires of frustration and discord are burning. In Let us city. not forget for a moment the toils and efforts that lie ahead. They say that those who forget their history are condemned to repeat it. This is the History Lessons Podcast with certified financial planning practitioner Patrick Huey, author of History Lessons for the Modern Investor and your guide to financial wisdom in the past, present, and future. You ready? Good. Let's get historical. Historical? Yes! This is the History Lessons Podcast for the week of 20 May, 2024. I'm Patrick Huey, author of History Lessons for the Modern Investor. And if you're a modern investor seeking some historical perspective right now, you're in the right place. This week, we'll be talking about mixed signals, celebrating longevity, and taking social security. But first, the news. Last week, amidst a whirlwind of economic data, Fed Chair Jerome Powell took center stage and delivered some headline-grabbing remarks. He admitted that recent data had put a dent in his confidence. Glad he still has some left, but not in his outlook. Powell's base case is still envisioning following inflation and a prolonged Fed pause, steering clear of further rate hikes. Here was his week in review. The week kicked off with an unexpected twist as the producer price index, PPI, rose by a robust 0.5% month over month in April. However, according to Powell, previous month's downward revisions turned this report into more of a mixed bag. Okay. Next up, the April consumer CPI index, Consumer Price Index report showed a slight slowdown in both headline and core inflation, with rates at 3.4% year-over-year and 3.6% year-over-year, respectively. And the peasants rejoiced. This report, while anticipated, marked the end of a series of upside inflation surprises, and that was much to Powell's relief. However, that relief may have been short-lived. To round out the week, import prices climbed by a firm 1.1% year-over-year, hinting that the disinflationary tailwinds from imported goods might be losing their punch a bit. If the summer driving season brings the usual spike in fuel prices, that could further dent the chairman's ebbing confidence. Industrial production hit the pause button in April after two months of gains. Non-auto manufacturing, the core version of industrial production, slipped 0.1% in April and is down half a percentage point from a year ago. Meanwhile, housing starts made a comeback, rising 5.7% in April. Despite the rebound, they remained below late 2023 pace. Main culprit? Duh, mortgage rates, which have stubbornly stayed high in response to recent inflation reports and they are weighing on housing activity. A poor Chairman Powell, his week was a roller coaster of economic data, inflation insights, and found it or not, cautious optimism. While the mixed signals keep everyone on their toes, Powell remains hopeful for a future with falling inflation and a Fed that's hitting the pause button on rate hikes and rate cuts, at least for now. Personally, I wish the man all the luck in the world. Interest rates are rising, and your annuity, purchased in the last decade, might not be keeping up, which means your financial plan may be falling behind. So if you own a deferred annuity, fixed, indexed, or variable worth more than $250,000, now is the time to review it and make sure it is doing all that it can for you and your financial plan. Let us help you keep your retirement on track. Introducing Victory Independent Planning. VIP turns complex financial matters into clear and confident solutions. So you can relax and enjoy retirement whenever it arrives. Get the annuity review kit now. This complimentary kit includes a variety of checklists, resources, and eBooks to review the fees, features, and flexibility, or lack thereof, in your current annuity contract. It will even help you assess your overall investment goals and the people who are offering you advice. Get the kit today 
because you can't teach an old annuity new tricks. To learn how VIP can help you review your annuity, click on the link in the show notes or go to victoryindependentplanning.com. That's victoryindependentplanning.com. Sign up for peace of mind today. Alexa, charge the Wayback Machine and set it for 1896 AD. Charging Wayback Machine. On May 26th, 1896, Charles Henry Dow publishes the first Dow Jones Industrial Average. Editor of the nascent Wall Street Journal, he added 12 prices of leading companies together and divided by 12 to arrive at 62.76. Now, the components of the index changed 52 times in coming years. In 1916, it expanded to include 20 stocks. And in 1928, it grew again to 30 stocks, a composition that remains in place to this day. The 1929 stock market crash led to the Great Depression, with the Dow Jones Industrial Average losing nearly 90% of its value from its high in 1929 to its low in 1932. Good times. During the mid-20th century, the Dow Jones Industrial Average reflected the post-World War II economic boom and industrial expansion in the United States, surpassing 500 points for the first time in 1956 and briefly hitting 1,000 in 1966, before falling off a bit. The Dow continued weighing its components by their price per share and the title industrial remains, despite a few modern components being involved in heavy industry, very few modern components in heavy industry. Little could Charles Henry Dow have imagined how his somewhat arbitrary index, now available with constant updates instead of just once per day, would affect generations of future investors. Last week during intraday trading, the Dow approached and briefly bypassed a milestone at the 40,000 level. Approaching a milestone of my own this summer, I turn 50 in June, I'm wary of giving arbitrary numbers too much attention. Add a deeper dive into the Dow backs up that theory. First, given the history of the Dow, the composition has obviously changed dramatically throughout the decades. So are you really comparing apples to apples, or in this case, apple to apple? And the price weighting leads to some oddities in calculating the index. For instance, anyone out there named the largest component in the Dow right now? The aforementioned Apple, Microsoft, maybe Goldman Sachs? All good guesses, but incorrect. Right now, United Healthcare is the largest component in the Dow Jones Industrial Average at just over 8.6%. 8 the fact that a healthcare company is the largest component after a huge run-up in technology shares over the last year should tell you that for better or for worse, the old Dow is much less sensitive to change than its counterpart, the S&P 500. Indeed, those tech companies we listed with ties to the booming AI industry are eighth, Microsoft, and 19th, Apple, in weightings inside the index. The Dow's recent run past 40,000 is no more significant than my own survival of the decade of my 40s. Yeah, longevity is preferable to the alternative. But let's not make a story, more of a story of this, than it really deserves. Wayback Machine disengaged. Returning to the year 2024. Finally, this week, it's on to the mailbag. You've got mail. This week's question of the week was, when should I begin my social security benefits? Now, remember, if you're listening to this podcast and want to see the visuals referenced during this segment, please join me on Substack where you can view the video version of this podcast or on YouTube where you can do the same. So I have a client who's 62 and I'll call him Ron, and he's worried about the future of social security. He wonders if he should be taking his benefits early, like now, to lock them in. You see, the Social Security Trust Fund recently uh, reported, and they raised some questions uh, that several of my clients in their 60s came to me with. They worry that the program is going to run out of money and they won't be able to claim benefits. Well, what the trustees said is actually no different than the report from last year. Uh, that without systemic changes to the programs, and there are a variety of programs within the wrapper of Social Security, 
that the fund will be depleted in 2033. Now, once the reserves are depleted, payroll taxes will continue to cover about 79% of Social Security expenditures, which is actually up a bit from last year's estimate of 77%. Yippee. So let's take a look at some of the ins and outs of Social Security, and I'll come back to Ron's story in a minute. So as you probably know, Social Security is the cornerstone or a cornerstone of retirement planning for many Americans, but deciding when to start taking benefits is a relatively complex decision, uh, certainly with long lasting implications. To give you a better understanding, let's break down the key factors to consider here. First, we'll talk about the basics. Uh, so obviously you can start taking social security benefits as early as age 62, um, but you may realize doing so will reduce your monthly benefit amount. Your full retirement age, or FRA, uh, which is around 66 or 67, depending on when you were born, is when you're eligible to receive your full benefit. And if you delay taking benefits past your FRA, your monthly benefit increases again up until age 70. So the question is, should you take benefits early, 62, at your FRA, full retirement age? or delay them further uh, up until age 70. Here are some factors that you should consider. Number one is life expectancy. Social security is designed to pay out the same total amount regardless of when you start taking it, assuming you live to an average life expectancy. So if you expect to live longer than the average, delaying benefits could result in higher lifetime payouts. And conversely, if you have health issues or a shorter life expectancy, Taking benefits earlier might make more sense. But the obvious issue here is most people, unless they have serious health issues, have no idea what their life expectancy is going to be. Number two, financial needs. Your current financial situation plays a big role. If you need the income to cover ex essential expenses and you don't have enough savings or other income sources, Taking the benefits early might be not only necessary, but your only option. On the other hand, if you've got sufficient retirement savings and you can afford to wait, delaying benefits could be beneficial. And that could somewhat depends on how you're investing um, those funds, how conservative you expect to be with them. And that will help you decide uh, on whether or not uh, you should delay. Number three employment status. If you plan to keep working past 62 while still filing for Social Security, it's important to know that taking your Social Security before your FRA can lead to reduction in benefits if your earnings exceed certain limits. So once you reach your FRA, no holds barred, you can work without any reduction in your benefits. Number four, spousal benefits. Think of your spouse. If you're married, you'll want to consider how your decision impacts your spouse. It may make sense to wait and maximize the amount of Social Security so that the spouse can inherit the higher benefit in case of death. Number five, inflation and cost of living adjustments. Social Security benefits are adjusted for inflation, but the increases are based on the initial amount you start with. So starting with a higher benefit by delaying can mean larger dollar value increases over time. So let's recap that with a, a quick pro-con list. Taking benefits early at age 62. The pros are you get immediate income, which is beneficial if you have a shorter life expectancy, and it's useful if you need the funds immediately. You don't have sufficient outside assets to cover cash flow while you wait, this may be your best and only option other than to continue to work. But that's no fun. The cons of taking benefits early is the permanent reduction in monthly benefits now and forever. All right, pros and cons of taking benefits at FRA, full retirement age. Pro number one, you get the full benefit amount. You get your full retirement amount. Okay, there's no reduction for working if you continue to do so. And it takes a balanced approach to the unsurety about life expectancy. You're kind of going with the middle option here. 
the cons of taking it at full retirement age, you do miss out on increased benefits from delaying to the tune of uh, 6% per year. And that might not be as beneficial if you have a longer life expectancy. Delaying benefits up to 70, here are the pros. Increased monthly benefits, duh. Now 8% higher per year for delaying between full retirement age up to age 70. Uh, that means higher lifetime benefits if you live longer and larger inflation inflation adjustments in dollar terms, not in percentage. Everybody gets the same percentage, but if you start with a higher base, the dollar values are higher. What are the cons to waiting till age 70? Well, you need to have other income sources to cover expenses, and there's a risk of not living long enough to benefit from the delay. Again, how would you know in advance? So ultimately, the decision on when to take Social Security benefits is personal and depends on your unique circumstances. So consulting with a financial advisor can help you tailor the decision to your specific situation. Hey, how about that? Now, remember, there's no one size fits all answer, but with the right information, you can make a decision that best supports your retirement goals. So let's go back to my client, Ron. And let's walk through and see how his decision-making pro uh, progressed with the help of this month's checklist. All right, first we reviewed his history and there were no general issues with his work history. Um, there were no issues with his benefits reporting or the credits he earned. He was in good standing with social security, ready to go whenever he was ready for it. Uh, but he certainly had questions on delaying. And we'll talk more about those in a second. Ron was not going to be working, but he did need to coordinate his spousal uh, claiming strategy with his spouse, Rhonda. As for the rest of the checklist... As for the rest of the checklist, nothing else really applied. Okay, so no ex-spouse issues, no state-specific issues. Um, and we had already done his tax uh, planning, so we were ready for what was coming with Social Security as an income source. Okay, so relatively straightforward for him. So what do I tell someone who should delay based on all the metrics, but thinks they should take benefits early to lock them in before the system runs out of money? Okay. When we look at the checklist, really the only issues that Ron had are, should I take it early? How do I get the most to my spouse? He's got outside assets and he can delay. He's in decent health. And in this case, he should delay his social security, okay? But he thinks the system's gonna run out of money based on what's been uh, appearing in the media lately. Well, first, let me say that most experts believe that this won't happen. I know experts, but bear with me. What they believe is that the political will to reform the system is going to materialize once it isn't a down the road problem but the one that could pop up in current terms for politicians trying to get reelected. And speaking of reelection, remember that one of the largest lobbying organizations in America is the AARP. And guess what? Older people don't like having this stuff tinkered with. Okay, so food for thought. Even if it does come about, that they never reform Social Security and the trustee fund runs out, as we discussed, payroll taxes will continue to fund 79% of the benefits. Now, in Ron's case, 21% cut in benefits would not be fun, like at all. But I'd rather take a haircut on more money than less money. What we know is he'll hit 70 well before 2034 rolls around. So I'm counseling him to wait for that bigger benefit, which Rhonda will take over when he passes. Remember, we're trying to think about 
maximizing money for the spouse as well. well. What if they change the program drastically before then? Wouldn't it be better to lock in those benefits now? Maybe, but what I'll tell you is that Congress would have to show one, an inkling that there is a problem, and two, the political will to work in a bipartisan manner to make such changes. Now, until either one of those unicorns appears, my advice is to wait and grab a bigger benefit that ultimately might be reduced, but probably not. Well, my fellow historians, that's all for this week. Check out my book, History Lessons for the Modern Investor. It's still available on Amazon.com. And be sure to do all the social stuff with me. Like this episode, follow me wherever you see or hear your podcasts. I'm available on Substack, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. Hey, until next week, we'll take another rollicking romp through the past and make an investment in your future with History Lessons for the Modern Investor. See you next week.